I'll message Louis. Okay, I think we are live. Okay, I will share this to my page. So hopefully if I go on to Facebook, things should be sorting themselves out. Okay, so here we go. Opening up. And doing the sits while we wait for people to turn up. And while people are cross posting and what have you. So hello people who are here already. Feel free to say hi and uh, where you are in the world. I'll do proper introductions and things when um, the room picks up a little bit, which it tends to. Hi, Simon. Oh, hi, Andrew. Oh, lovely. Lots of lovely learners coming. Oh, and Ian, yep. Awkward wave. And Bobby, lovely. Oh, it's so nice because like I say, you get to see the same sorts of people coming in, which is nice to learn. All right, let me just oh, check that I've... Uh... Anybody who never typically says anything in the comment section, feel free, free to be brave and say hi, even if you never comment um, anything afterwards. Oh, yep, yeah, Andrew's in Sheffield. So we're just filling up. Like I say, I will do proper introductions in a minute. Lovely. Well, we're filling up, so I can do a quick introduction. Um, so I am Dr. Chloe Farahar of All Academy. Um, for those of you who potentially are new, we are um, an educative platform that educates about anything relating to autistic experience, um, but only from uh, autistic educators or otherwise neurodivergent people. And when we say educators, we mean any autistic person with a topic um, that they feel they can explain to us. And that can be in any way, it could be a presentation, could be cartoon if you wanted to, if anyone's feeling um, particularly creative. Um, and today I am joined by David Gray Hammond and I'm going to bring up my notes so I actually remember all the things you do because you are a very busy human being. There are we. We've had David on before because um, he covers a number of topics and we had him on before talking about autistics and uh, experiencing addiction. Um, so if you're wanting to learn about that and haven't already, you can catch up about that on our Facebook page under videos or on the YouTube channel. Um, so, hello, David. Hello. It's always weird saying it like we weren't on here already before yeah. going live. Um, so David is a voice hearer or experiences psychosis, and we will discuss actually the terminology that you prefer, I think, during this chat, which will be good. You're an advocate and you are the COE for Neuroclastic. I'm the COO. The COO. OK, what is I, too many acronyms? COO. What does that stand for? Chief Operating Officer. Chief Operating Officer. OK, um, and for those people who don't necessarily know what neuroclastic is, would you like to explain? Uh, neuroclastic is a, a, an online, uh, it's a, it's an advocacy website where we, we publish, um, we publish writing by autistic people and allies, mostly autistic people. It's run by a team of volunteers who are all autistic themselves. Um, and it is currently one of the biggest, uh, publication websites for pro neurodiversity um uh material uh, on the internet get a lot of articles if i want to know about something i think i tend to go to neuroclastic so if people aren't aware of that site already um it is worth knowing about um you are or have been a consultant with the charity mind yes i was a service user consultant um i used to well i technically i still do but it's been a while since we've done anything because of everything that's happening in the world um i i used to regularly sit in uh commissioning meetings and policy and strategy meetings 
uh, to represent neurodivergent addicts um, and people uh, experiencing complex mental health problems in the addiction community. Um, so I, yeah, I've I've done stuff like that. I know. So you've, like I say, you've got a lot of um, feathers to your cap. I think that's the correct phrase. Um, and you're on the panel for Brighton and Hove to redesign the substance misuse services. I sat on a panel to choose uh, to help choose a uh, uh, the the new provider um, of su substance misuse services. That was a couple of years ago now, though. And today we are covering, um, obviously from a personal perspective, but um, autistic experiences of psychosis um, or otherwise what I would describe either as voice hearing or visual hallucinations and delusions. Um, I'm not going to chat too much from my own perspective. Um, I'm hoping it will kind of inform my questions and things. Um, but for those who potentially don't know, my um, PhD was on the reduction of mental health stigma with a script about neurodiversity. So I've been fascinated for personal reasons and academic reasons um, in mental health and the stigma that surrounds it um, since I can remember. Um, so it's sort of 17 and I'm 36 now. So my special interest that hasn't waned since I was like in my teen, teen years, teenage years. Um, but yeah, I have a, a particular way of understanding these experiences. So I'm quite keen to have this discussion with you, David. Um, and I guess we kind of obviously discussed already what we might talk about. But from your perspective, why do you feel that we're discussing this topic? Why is this potentially important for people? Well, as with addiction, which obviously we covered about a month ago, it's something that I think is probably more common in the autistic community than people realize. Um, I know from professionals I've worked with that the vast majority of voice hearers they work with were actually autistic. Um, and I think there's a lot of stigma surrounding psychosis and voice hearing. Um, and it's important that we get this discussion going so that people can see that actually it's it's a very I don't want to say it's a very common thing but relatively it's it's more common than you would imagine and that you know we're not all these insane serial killers that Hollywood would have you believe we are um you know I I think it's yeah it, it's just important to have this discussion and 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 say you know look we're we're here you know, we, we, we're voice hearers, we suffer delusions, we, we see things that other people don't see, but we're, we're, we're still, you know, we're, we're amongst you. We, we, you, you can't, you, it, much like, you know, with autism, when people are like, oh, you don't look autistic, you know, you, you don't, look like you're a voice hearer either you know we're just we're amongst the general population and you could walk past someone on the street and not realize that they're a voice hearer or suffering delusions you know and I think it's important to raise awareness of that and I think from my perspective it is about normalizing those experiences because actually hallucinating is an incredibly human thing um, and it's something that I've taught on in my stigma reduction um, training that I've done for about seven years, which is the normalcy of hallucinating. Um, and I like to, I, I, I typically ask people for examples of like, if they can remember a time when they've hallucinated. And I usually say it could have been a fever as a child, or it could have been um, through stress or sleep deprivation or through drug taking. And I'm like, you don't have to tell me which, just hands up if you've ever hallucinated. Um, and, you know, a few people will put their hands up and then I explain how easy it is to um, make somebody hallucinate. Because have you heard of those um, sensory deprivation chambers that they use yes. in a lot of studies? Yeah. And any human being who hasn't or doesn't consider themselves to have ever experienced hallucinations or psychosis before will start hallucinating between 20 to 40 minutes later of being in these sensory deprivation chambers because our brain 
it needs stimulation. So if it's not there, it creates it for you, which is an interesting yeah. per, you know, reason for hallucinations. And then I go that little bit further and I then say to the um, attendees, and what if I told you you're all hallucinating right now? Um, because we actually are hallucinating um, constantly because you have a, uh, a blind spot that's literally in the center of your eye because of the way eyes have, have evolved. You have the, um, uh, oh, too late in the day for my brain to work, but the part of the brain, the part of the eye that goes into the brain doesn't have any receptors or anything. So there's literally a black dot constantly in the center of our vision, but your brain hallucinates to fill in the gaps. So it's just trying to explain the normalcy, normalcy of these things, um, I think is quite important. Um, are we all right to jump in with kind of your first experiences or how you experience psychosis? Um, yeah, so my first experience, I was, I, I, well, depends where you want to start from. As a child, I used to experience what my mother and doctors called night terrors, um, where I would be awake, but I clearly wasn't. In reality, I would be running around the house very distressed, seeing things that weren't there. And it was typically happening to me. I fall asleep and within an hour or so of falling asleep, I would wake back up and be in this hallucinatory state. Um, but th that started to pass a bit when I was a teenager. And then when I was about 18 and a half, um, I, a long term girlfriend of mine, uh, we broke up. And within a few days of that, I and I'd also moved out of my mother's house um, at the same time. And uh, within a few days of that, I started hearing voices. Uh, I kept hearing people saying my name. And obviously, I was I was very scared. Um, I only knew what you know what the popular. Oh no, David, you're frozen. Oh no. Okay. Um, hopefully he'll be back on. Um, and he was just talking about the, um, the stereotypes basically. So obviously um, I know a lot of people who experience voice hearing or hallucinations or delusions. I can explain actually, I think in a second, the differences um, between the two uh, uh, hallucinations and delusions. Um, and importantly, because of the number of people that I've known, including both my parents who both experienced psychosis and uh, a lot of my friends and a lot of the, not a lot, but a number of the autistic people that I support also experience um, hallucinations. Um, yeah, I don't have obviously that stereotypical view or understanding and I've not feared um, somebody based on the knowledge that they hallucinate in regularly. Um, I've asked permission to use some examples from Jessica as well. So Jessica, who um, works with us for Academy and um, is Harry's PA, also experiences um, hallucinations. And I think what was interesting about what David was just saying was that, oh, I've lost my train of thought because I'm hoping David's just about to pop back in. Okay, sorry, David's just about to come back in. Anyone know what my train of thought was? Oh, that David was saying, you know, you wouldn't know typically, the, there's a large number of people, um, it's around 5.5% of the general population that experiences hallucinations on a semi-regular basis. Um, and that would be a, a typically non-clinical population as well, just people who, who experience hallucinations regularly. And the difference being that they're not necessarily distressed by their hallucinations per se. Um, and so with Jessica, like say, who um, uh, works with us um, via Academy, um, in terms of her hallucinations, because of my understanding and my background, just going to let David back in, um, because of my understanding and my background, I have sat with Jessica as we're having a conversation um, and she's looked um, above my head Hi, David. I'm just finishing a, a sentence and then we'll bring you back in again. Um, but yeah, Jessica was sort of staring at the top of my head and I was like, oh, no, have I got a bug on my head or something? 
And she was like, oh no, there's just a red balloon there. And um, I was kind of like, oh, okay. You know, and there was, I just take it as granted. That's what she's seeing. Um, and there's no need to, well, we can have a conversation about it if she wants to, but it's not typically something that needs to be more, uh, given more attention than, oh, okay, cool. Sorry, David. Yeah, I just thought I'd fill in a little bit before. I thought yeah. I'd hopefully come back. Yes, yeah, so I don't know what happened there. For some reason, my router just disappeared. Um, and so, uh, so sadly, we got to the point where you were explaining that um, obviously you are quite distressed because you only knew the stereotypical um, narrative about voice hearers, for instance. So you were hearing um, voices and that was distressing. because. Yes, yeah, so I was... I, I I'd started hearing voices I was distressed I I didn't I was convinced that if I told anyone I would be locked up in an institution and uh, as I discussed on the other live stream that was the point at which I started self-medicating with uh, at the time cannabis and alcohol and later on harder drugs um, and for a time the drugs and alcohol kind of kept things in check I didn't feel as anxious about it it wasn't happening as frequently um and yes i for a long time i didn't really it was happening but i wasn't necessarily thinking about it all the time because for a, for a long time my focus was on the drugs and the alcohol um but it it started to my mental health started to deteriorate um, towards the end of my university course. Um, and it was at that time that uh, a psychiatrist did start me on an antipsychotic at a low dose, although it wasn't particularly effective. And uh, when I moved back to Brighton from university, um, I saw more psychiatrists and uh, they tried various medications and stuff to no avail, probably not helped by the fact that I was using a lot of illicit substances, um, including psychedelics, because I kind of figured in my head, well, if I'm going to have these weird experiences anyway, I may as well have control over when they're happening. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it, it really became prominent when I achieved sobriety. Um, I very quickly started hearing voices very frequently. I was hearing six or seven voices, different voices regularly. Um, I had one which I, uh, I called the demon, um, which used to just tell me terrifying things that would become the basis of my delusions. Um, there was another one that I called the sociopath that um, basically just tried to talk me into doing horrible things to people, which I found very distressing because that's, that's not who I am. Um, there were two voices I always remember. And uh, my friends and I always joke it was a bit like a Waldorf and Statler kind of thing. They would just comment on everything I did and complain about everything I did and judge everything I did which affected my confidence greatly um, but I also had visual hallucinations um, I would regularly see spiders or rodents or insects in my bed or on me um, which could be quite scary because at the time I had quite a severe phobia of spiders um, uh, and yeah um i also uh i i saw th this one was a bit more of a, a a curveball because i had one hallucination in particular that wasn't distressing and it was a woman in a black dress and whenever i was lonely this woman in a black dress she would come and she'd just sit with me or stand in the room with me she never spoke i never even particularly saw her face but whenever I was lonely or really suffering, she would just be there with me. Um, and obviously at the time I thought she was real um, because, um, and I'll get into this more, but the reason why I tend to refer to it as psychosis rather than just voice hearing is because I was at one point completely unaware that the stuff happening to me was not real. 
I thought what was happening was 100% real. So this this woman in the black dress, and I, I still see her from time to time now, especially at low points, um, would just be there with me. Um, and uh, I mean, at first it was quite alarming, but once I established that there was no malicious intent to her presence, I, I kind of became more comfortable with that experience. And can I pick up on a few things? So it's so kind of it's it's obviously from my perspective and it's always interesting. And I hope that's not an offensive word because I do find voice hearing and hallucinations and delusions really interesting. And obviously I don't have a negative or judgmental um, take on those experiences. It is interesting. Yeah, because it's <laughs> it, because when you when you kind of look at the content of the hallucinations or the delusions, they do reflect kind of typical um, cognitive processes anyway, or cognitive you know, things that you're thinking. So obviously it's interesting that when you're lonely, you see this figure and, and to some extent that could be um, comforting. Yeah. If you're lonely. You've got those other, um, like potentially the voices, like you say, the, the sociopath one that's potentially saying quite, mean things or, or trying to get you to do um uh, persuade you to do mean things um and what's quite interesting about that is even if you're not a voice hearer or experience any hallucinations or anything like that we do that all the time to some extent you know you if you're uh, annette always discusses how if she's walking down a street and she's really overwhelmed in her head she's imagining shooting people because she's an autistic who's really overwhelmed she would never do it but it's still content in, in your mind. And what I've always found, um, like I say, really interesting and actually quite important for some of the um, uh, typically autistic people who I talk to who experience hallucinations um, is trying to explain the mechanics of it because it kind of takes away the, the scary power of, of hallucinations. So for instance, um, you may be aware of this. So if you are, uh, it'll be to educate the learners in the comment section. Um, but when, um, for instance, voice hearers hear voices, it's, well, we're always hearing voices or to some extent, because you've got an inner voice, obviously. So you've got a part of the brain, which is nowhere near as um, uh, simplistic as I'm going to describe it. But you've got a part of the brain that tells you that right now, what you're hearing is this squeaky woman on Zoom and it's external to you. It's external to your, who you are as, as a person. And then the same or similar part of the brain then also tells you when you're thinking to yourself, ah, oh, okay, I'm thinking and that's internal to me. And what's interesting with, um, for instance, like I say the voice hearing is that that gets switched. So the internal is projected and feels and in very realistically is external to you does that make sense yes it does and that's that's very much what happened you know the weird thing was though is that the, the switch was very literal because when I heard the voices I would hear them coming from outside of my head like you know so people talk about hearing voices in your head but for me it they were external voices and I that's how I heard them. Can I ask, because you obviously said there's a number of different voices and some of them you've named and things. Did they have um, a particular, uh, did they inhabit a particular space around you? So I, I had a friend or have a friend who when he voice hid, it was always a very particular, it was about, he always sort of described it, the voice was coming from out here and it was always whispering, um, didn't matter obviously whether we had really loud music on so it was really interesting because it was it was um projected obviously from his brain as if it was here in space does that make sense yeah for me all of my voices tended to come as if someone was sort of talking right next to my ear um and uh the volume would change depending on typically how distressed i was um and I did find ways around it as well. Like I, I discovered that if I put headphones in and blared my music really loud, I could sort of drown it out. And so that was one of the ways people sort of knew that I was really struggling was because they would find me constantly with headphones in 
um but with really loud music and obviously that came with its own problems i have tinnitus now because of the amount of loud music i've listened to um but yeah they they did occupy the, the sort of this space around my head um and they would just come at me sort of like the the more distressing voices i would hear in both ears um the 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 less distressing voices i might hear in one ear or another like and it i couldn't typically predict which ear i would hear it in um but yeah they definitely did occupy like a particular space and i think that's really important for people to know and understand is that you genuinely when you hallucinate i don't mean you i mean you know any you that um, experiences uh, voice hearing or, or hallucinations, um, your brain is generally, genuinely, sorry, making that sensory experience. So it's very real. Um, and, and one of my favorite papers that I read as an undergrad was on how to support, it was, it was a qualitative um, study. It was just asking people about their experiences of voice hearing or, or hallucinations, visual hallucinations and things. And, um, it was kind of what came out of it was something lovely from one of the participants who was hallucinating snakes. And they said the best thing that their friend did when they said there's snakes everywhere. Now, the friend obviously can't see the snakes. They can't share in that reality. And But to tell that hallucinator that there are no snakes is not necessarily that helpful because no. for that person, they are there. Your, your brain is creating that sensory um, uh, experience. So the friend said, okay, where are they? Here's my baseball bat, I'm gonna get them kind of thing. And it wasn't to feed into their hallucinations. It was to kind of work through what the issue was with the hallucinations, which was, you know, these, these um, snakes being in front of them. And I thought that was actually quite lovely. So obviously if you've got any friends or family who learned how to support you when you experience so my family and uh my my best friend jay um when i've experienced visual hallucinations they they will um like for example my i lived with my mum when i was going through the thick of it and uh, i would regularly wake her up in the middle of the night and tell her there were spiders in my bed and rather than her just going no david there's no spiders go back to bed she would and i really appreciate this because she would get out of bed at like four o'clock in the morning she would come to my room she would search all through my bed you know and then that gave me time to calm down because someone was looking as well um and then when my mum couldn't find them, I'd be more willing to accept that they weren't there because my mum would say, look, David, I, I can't find the spiders there. I, I don't think there's a spider in your bed. And I would be sort of like, oh, OK, well, maybe there isn't then. But it, it was at no point did anyone ever act like I was some kind of weirdo for having these experiences. To this day, my friends and family, you know, if I if I'm having these experiences, it's just a bit like, OK cool um what can we do to help do you need help um you know and uh it, i because i found and i think my mum learned this quite quickly especially especially when i was experiencing delusions the more you try and fight it the harder you cling on to it um especially because i mean i was suffering delusions i i was convinced at one point that i was uh, trapped in a computer simulation and that someone was trying to delete me from existence uh, I thought I had microchips implanted in my skin that were broadcasting my thoughts um, I thought people were poisoning my food um, and you know I, I had a lot of persecutory delusions and ra rather than people saying David none of that's real you know people learn to say okay well let's let's explore why why you're worried this is happening um because the minute someone just turned around and said no david that's not real i would cling on to it tighter and they would become part of the paranoia and like okay well they're obviously part of this because they're trying to convince me it's not real um you know and it, it did get really complicated for a while because eventually got to a point where i thought my mother and sister were imposters who were pretending to be my mother and sister 
Um, and that really, that was really difficult for me because my mother and sister are probably the two people I trust most in the world. And for a brief period, psychosis took that away from me. Um, but the people in my life have really learned to, to not just immediately dismiss the things that my brain is coming up with. You know, there's always a reason for it. And, and if you were to give advice to somebody wanting to support somebody who experiences psychosis, what would that be? So would it be to obviously, I don't mean necessarily to go along with the delusions per se, but obviously not to fight them because that's really a, not going to help the situation. So what would be useful for you, for instance? Okay, so trying I think rather than trying to dismiss the delusions like don't do that because they're just going to cling on to them harder and don't just go along with the delusions either because that that's problematic for a while I'm sure you can see why that would be problematic um but you need to talk and get to try and work out where because a lot of the delusions for me came from a place of fear and through talking to my friends my family and going through therapy I established that a lot of my delusions came from a fear of dying a fear of not being here anymore uh, you know I had persecutory delusions because I'd seen a lot of death I'd experienced a lot of loss and my brain had just decided that clearly I was under threat of not being here anymore and my brain came up with a mutually combati com compatible reality with that fear which is really where the fear that I was in a computer simulation about to be deleted came from um, and <clears throat> it was more helpful to have people talk to me and try and get to the bottom of that fear than it was to have them try and dismiss or go along with the delusions and a lot of the older papers that I would have read as an undergrad used to make me angry because they would say things like the hallucinations or the things that people who, who are experiencing psychosis say are, they, it's meaningless and I would apps I argued from a very early age that that's nonsense that you can definitely find the logic to the hallucinations and the, the delusions um, and I just want to pick up on because of the kind of is making me think about this as well is that you know arguably and this is my understanding anyway is that all um anything that we can class as a mental health condition or issue um is the result of trauma or traumas even if we're not aware of what that might be and and i've said before that trauma can be anything to anybody like it, nobody gets to dictate that and so you know living living in poverty and um uh, experiencing racism and bullying and obviously the, the things that we would normally um, understand as trauma as well you know assaults and um, neglect and all sorts of things like that and the human brain has this capacity to do things that doesn't necessarily look like it's um, beneficial such as hallucinating but I argue it's it's still a rather reasonable thing for a brain to do does that make sense so yeah it's a lot of the time, even if it doesn't necessarily seem like it, particularly when they're quite persecutory and distressing hallucinations or delusions, is there still to some extent your brain trying to protect you? Yeah. From further trauma. And so yeah. like, like you said, trying to get at what what is the crux of why am I having these experiences? can help you even if you still experience hallucinations um, and things like that so I don't think it, it's particularly I don't know how you feel like I don't feel like it's particularly um, beneficial to fight psychosis if that makes sense like to just I, I can imagine it's quite distressing and then so potentially you would love to never experience psychosis again but I don't know how you found that if that's been useful for you to to fight against it does that make sense um i mean in a sense i did fight against it because i i took medication 
and that medication has been really important to my well-being um, and you know yes it, it has for the most part taken away those experiences I, I still do have those experiences especially during times of heightened stress um, and there's always a risk of full relapse because medication is imperfect but I did use medication to fight against it. And this was prescription medication, not myself yeah, I, medication. I, I just want to clarify. I don't necessarily mean not taking meds per se. I, I guess it's trying to work through it and understand. Well, this is what I, this is what I was going to get onto okay. is um, on top of that though. And I think this is the important part. I have had extensive talking therapy with trained psychologists who specialize in my sorts of experiences. Um, and this is the point I was going to make is it's all very well fighting psychosis with medication, but I think it's vital that you also have that therapeutic experience, that talking uh, experience where you work through. And for most of us, I think it's working through trauma because I do believe my brain is wired differently, not just because I'm autistic, but I believe there is something in my brain that makes me more susceptible to these experiences. Um, but on top of that, it is a trauma response for me. I have I, I have been through a really extensive number of traumas in my life, not all related to each other either. Some people might say I've been exceptionally unlucky. I say some people, that's what my therapist said. Um, but it was inevitable really that something like this would happen uh, given the amount of trauma I've been through and as you say whilst it was a very distressing experience it was my brain trying to rationalize the experiences I had had leading up to it you know I I when I was seven years old my best friend died and then when I was 13 my grandmother died and you know I was very much involved in the 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 deaths of of those people um and there was a, a lot of other stuff that happened and eventually my brain just the reality of what had happened obviously became too much for my brain and my brain said right well this doesn't make any sense to us why would this keep happening to us oh, I it, it must be this and came up with a like a protective reality that was easier to understand and certainly my delusions for me anyway were much easier to rationalize to myself than all of the trauma I had been through and I think because I haven't made the point, which I probably should have done right at the beginning, is that for those who are watching, um, what the difference is between hallucinating and delusions. Um, and usually when I explain it, it's um, hallucinating would be, um, you know, seeing, smelling, potentially being able to touch or feel the queen. Um, and a delusion would be, I am the queen. So just to try and help people in the um, comment section to kind of differentiate between hallucinations and delusions um, and I, I know it was it's been quite helpful when I've given talks before when I've had people experience hallucinations in the audience to validate that so I had one person who actually experienced tactile hallucinations which are not as common as for instance voice hearing so the you know feel of something um, sometimes it's insects and things like that um, but they'd been told by their own therapist that it was unlikely that that it would they didn't even explain that you oh you're hallucinating tactile sensations um, and so just allowing them to know that gave them the knowledge and armed them with the knowledge that what they were experiencing was real in the sense of their brain was genuinely making them feel something if that makes sense I've yeah. on a tangent. No, I mean, that's a good explanation. Um, another way I would explain delusions, and I wish I could remember that there was a, that someone on social media made a video, and I, for the life of me, I can't remember what their name was, but they had this amazing way of explaining delusions. And it went, this is paraphrasing to quite an extent, but it, the gist of it was um, the sky is blue. You've always seen the sky is blue. But suddenly everyone around you is telling you, no, the sky is purple, but you're convinced the sky is blue because you look at the sky and it's blue. But everyone around you is telling you, no, the sky is purple. And, and that's kind of what it's like to experience a delusion. It, it, everyone around you is saying that's not real. And, but it is real to you. Everything about it is a hundred percent real to you. And it, it's just, 
I I still my my brain still gets overwhelmed trying to work out how something like how my delusion seemed so real to me because okay I still experience paranoia related to those delusions to an extent especially when I'm under stress but looking back like my entire reality was just completely replaced by something else that my my brain it was just my brain just it felt like one day my brain just went nope this is what we believe now and and it it's it's a mind-blowing thing to recover from and look back and go how did that happen <laughs> like, well it, i want to pick up on um because you obviously we, we we're always trying to relate this to being autistic as well um and you have explained that you've had a, a much greater number of traumatic experiences um than is even typical for people who've been through traumas or, or, or something along those lines from your therapist isn't that correct um yeah. and the fact that did you say that it's somebody you know another therapist or somebody who sees a lot of autistic people who also experience psychosis yeah so i had a care coordinator which um for anyone who isn't familiar with secondary level mental health care in the uk care coordinators are uh, typically a psychiatric nurse who is assigned to you to ensure that you have appropriate access to your psychiatrist to therapy um, that your living situation is suitable and basically they, they, they literally coordinate your care um, and my care coordinator once said to me I, I said you know I, I was I was feeling like no one else was having this experience of being autistic and psychosis um and she said actually david the vast majority of people i support who are voice hearers who experience psychosis are also autistic she said it's a very common thing amongst autistic people in her experience and i would certainly argue given that we've got you know research um that demonstrates autistic people are much more likely to be victims of abuse and trauma compared to um, non-autistic populations. I'll, I'll try and remember the um, reference when I find it. I know I know um, Simon Baron Cohen's one of the co-authors. Um, was that the 2017 paper? But yeah, demonstrating that we're more likely to experience childhood abuse and bullying, etc. And as adults, um, abuse and victimisation and things. And then they compared it to non-autistic populations. And then they obviously looked at, I say obviously, but then they looked at the rates of mental health issues for the autistic population and the non-autistic population that they'd already um, uh, identified levels of trauma that they'd experienced. And you could see the autistic people who'd experienced more trauma also experienced more mental health concerns compared to yeah. the non-autistic population. Um, so I want to kind of make it clear for people who are watching, we're not saying that to be autistic means you are more likely to experience psychosis. I think we are just as susceptible to mental health concerns as the non-autistic population is. What I would argue is that we experience higher rates of abuse and victimization for being different and then we experience more mental health issues because of that as a result is that would you is that fair to say is, would you understand it that way or do you understand yeah. it a different way i mean i have often wondered if something about the because obviously we know as autistic people our brains are wired differently to the the neurological majority I'm going to be clear, there's no definitive research that demonstrates we have a different wiring. It makes it very okay. complicated. Yeah, okay. Um, but that seems to be the general consensus amongst autistic people, at least, even if not... Uh, not yeah, it's not demonstrated empirically, but that's the feeling that we have, yeah. And I've often wondered that if we are... Uh, wired differently um as as people say whether that does make us perhaps more susceptible to things like psychosis but that's that's just something i've wondered about i can't say that's necessarily something i believe um 
very much I would agree with you that as autistic people, we we experience higher rates of trauma perhaps than than the neurotypical population because well we're autistic living in a neurotypical world and that world can often be hostile to us um and so yeah i i do think perhaps what my care coordinator saw as it being quite common amongst autistic people was what she was actually seeing was how common trauma is amongst autistic people. I mean, I can't say that for def def definite without obviously knowing those particular cases, but that would be my argument based on um, the, lit the research and the literature. Um, but I, like I say, that's, that's my, my perspective, my argument, and I don't want to detract from somebody else's perspective. No, um, no. Uh, let me see what other questions we've we've covered quite a number of ours i knew we would without even having to well something i was going to add whilst we're talking about the uh, the autistic experience of psychosis was um something that was i feel per perhaps something that could be quite unique to being autistic was that i was viewed as atypical in my presentation i i did not I never received a diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective because in the words of my psychiatrist, you're not typical of those diagnoses. And obviously now that I've, I, I've reached a point of recovery where I'm more level headed and not experiencing delusions and I can look back and see what happened and know that it wasn't real. Um, I, my answer to him would be is I am autistic when am I ever typical <laughs> um you know and the, the, this was one of the ones we wanted to bring up wasn't it because it does seem from my limited sample size of people that I know who are autistic and experience psychosis is that it is an atypical experience of psychosis and you're exactly right or, or I would argue right that being autistic then means that while well, we experience similar or uh, mental health issues as the non-autistic population, our very autistic nature will determine a different quality to those experiences. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, because I had the note here. So atypical psychosis for autistic people may mean not diagnosed with I, i.e. Um, typical schizophrenia, although I have problems with the terminology and the diagnostic um, yeah i mean i certainly do know of autistic people who have diagnoses of schizophrenia schizoaffective but i i know in my experience i never got literally the only thing ever written down on my uh diagnostic pieces of paper was psychosis um which always really frustrated me because i'm very aware that psychosis in itself is more of a symptom of something else than than an actual diagnosis um, or at least that's my understanding of it. And I always found that very frustrating. Yeah, I mean, typically that I have a lot of issue with, I mean, the DSM, I pretty much just want to put in the bin anyway. Um, yeah. I'd much rather discuss and describe somebody's experiences than a so-called diagnosis. So that's why me personally, I refer to um, the voice hearing community. Um, but, but I completely understand your um, perspective of using the terminology psychosis because you also experience delusions for instance yeah. um, and things like that so I, I just feel like it's trying to take back the language for the people that experience those things yeah I mean one of the, the di most difficult parts about not having the diagnosis for me was that like I would try and explain to people my experiences and they'd go oh so you have schizophrenia and I'd go well no and they'd go but you just described schizophrenia I'm like yeah but it, it wasn't typical and it, it just it, it would really have been helpful just to have had a word that everyone could understand you know like when I say I'm autistic a lot of people these days go oh okay yeah autistic I, I get it yeah I, I have some understanding of what that word means but when you say psychosis people know the word schizophrenia I, I, I was amazed the number of people who had never heard the word psychosis um yeah or the ones who had heard it had heard specifically the word psychotic, which I do use sometimes when I'm to, when I talk about when I was psychotic, because I tend to use person, sorry, identity first language. It's just, you know, it's a reflex for me. Um, but to be honest, again, as somebody who's experienced those things, 
it is absolutely down to you how you identify how you word it how you describe it which is why yeah. I said I wanted to check how you because like I say me personally I talk about voice hearers but with you we can talk about psychosis more than anything I think the reason I try to use the word psychotic when talking about my experiences is because I'm very aware that people who've watched horror movies will have heard the word psychotic and um, they start thinking about psychopathy and serial killers and dangerous people and I really want to combat that that narrative yeah. like psychotic does not mean dangerous yeah you can be a danger to yourself you can be a danger to others when you're psychotic but it it, it doesn't innately mean that you are dangerous in any way shape or form in fact um, you'd probably know more about this than me but based on the literature I've read people experiencing psychosis are more likely to be victims than perpetrators that's the same for all mental health issues. Yeah, they're all more likely to be victims of abuse or or anything like that or harm than perpetrators of harm. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with I think I kind of understand to some extent. It's quite difficult because I've always been not an insider in the same way you have, but very much on the inside of understanding psychosis and things like that. Like, say, so both my parents um experienced psychosis throughout their adult lives um so I've you know one of my earliest memories is visiting my parents on a psychiatric ward and I was quite quite small um so it's the norm for me and I've lost my train of thought you said something and it was important uh I think I was talking about the fact that psychotic doesn't necessarily mean dangerous thank you yes and because people do have that stereotype and basically um so fundamentally what my research and what um, the stigma uh, literature explains is the best way to reduce stigma and prejudice and stereotypes is to just meet more and more of those people that you're scared of basically um and the more obviously i've met of, of um the more autistic or people that I've met who experienced psychosis over the years you just see the variability you see that there's no harm um call you know there's no threat to you um the, the less likely you are then to hold those sort of negative stereotypes but, but people I can to some extent I can understand outsiders who do have that fear because they don't understand they they assume that because you're hearing um uh, voices that are telling you to harm other people that that means you're going to jump on that voice or that impulse but it's the same as if you weren't voice hearing or hallucinating like I said we hear those sorts of voices all the time when you really are fed up with somebody or I'm sure there's lots of people on here potentially that have imagined I don't know whacking their husband over the head with a frying pan when he's not done the washing up again the way that they wanted this is not in any way um, related to my relationship <laughs> <laughs> but do you see what it means so we all have those sorts of thoughts and impulses but we don't do anything with them and I think it's fair to say that the majority of people who do experience psychosis hallucinating and delusions they still have they're still human beings who get to decide whether they follow those voices or impulses does that make yeah. sense yeah yeah I mean I've come to understand especially with the voice that used to tell me to do horrible things to people because I, I actually have a diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder and I've realized that some of the voices I heard especially were almost like a literal manifestation of the intrusive thoughts of my obsessive compulsive disorder um you know I, I this is something I found is that um my psychosis took a lot of different parts of my brain and brought it all together in one overall experience um so you know when when I had a a voice in my head saying oh you know and yeah I had voices that were like yeah you should go stab that person and I found that really really distressing because I'm definitely not going to do that but then I'm like well why why is that happening like you know and it, it was something I'd already struggled with because of obsessive compulsive disorder so I I'd, it it was it's a really difficult experience to explain when you have those sorts of in intrusive experiences um, because so many people when they hear about them they assume it's because you want to do that 
I, I do not want to do no. that. I have no interest in doing that. It doesn't help that I have a degree in forensics and part of my life has been making jokes about murdering people um, because I have a very dark sense of humor. And yeah, um, but you know, it, I have experienced a lot of stigma, especially around the voice hearing. You know, people really think that I might be dangerous because I'm a voice hearer. And I, I found that really upsetting. And I guess really that's that's why I that's why I wanted to do this live stream today is because I want people to see that, yeah I'm a voice here but I'm not dangerous <laughs> like you know I'm not going to harm you I if anything people are going to harm me and that was my general belief even through the psychosis you know um and I just think it's it's especially for autistic people who are already treated not very well and that's me putting it very lightly you know as we said we are already as autistic people victimized at a higher rate so then if you're an autistic person who experiences delusions voice hearing visual hallucinations that stigma is then i don't i couldn't even imagine how much whether it's doubled tripled quadrupled yeah. but it, it it just it all adds up and it it then becomes more trauma, which can then feed more mental health concerns. And this is the issue as well. And again, one of the main reasons. So initially, when I started um, my undergraduate degree, when I was 26 in psychology, I thought I wanted to go into clinical psychology. And then, and, and if anyone, <laughs> shameless plug, if anyone buys the Neurodiversity Reader, my chapter in there um, details a number of things, but it also includes how I went into psychology having been reading whatever I could, because I didn't do very well at school, I just went to libraries um, when I quit school, because I still wanted to learn, but school wasn't the place for me. Um, I was reading anything I could, went into psychology thinking I wanted to do clinical psychology, because I wanted to work out why my mum and dad were mentally ill, in quotation marks, and to figure out if there's something I could do to cure them in quotation marks again of their psychosis of their voice hearing and so on and so forth and what I realized as I started doing my own research and doing my undergrad and all that kind of thing is that it's bigger than the individual struggling it's the stigma it's looking at the research the stigma is the thing that makes a person's um, prognosis or a person's um, life and well-being worse than the psychosis itself for instance so you're yeah you're absolutely right it's like a double-edged sword you end up with the stigma from being autistic and the stigma from experiencing um psychosis as well um which is why we talk about these things so we can stamp on it yeah and i think it's really interesting you mentioned the whole curing it kind of thing because this is something i've gone back and forth on for years the the full-on experience of a psychotic episode and i don't just mean like a bit of voice hearing or a little bit of paranoia i mean when i was deep in the thick of it and i was fully delusional and and seeing and hearing things regularly the one there i was very distressed and yeah i take medication to to control those symptoms because i can't i hate using the word functioning but i can't function without the medication because it is just too overwhelming an experience. Um, but I'm not convinced I would ever want it to completely go away because, for example, uh, as I said to you when we you know, had this chat before the live stream, um, I no longer have a fear of spiders because I hallucinated spiders so regularly that it's just, it's just like, eh, it's a spider. You know, it, the, I, I have... The, I've taken things from the experience of psychosis and they have been positive. And it also is part of what makes me me, the fact that I have these experiences. Without these experiences, I would be a different person. And actually, I quite like the person I am now. And so I'm not convinced I would ever want it completely cured because it would it would be like cutting an arm off. You know, it's a part of me and I you know good or bad it it makes me who i am and and i guess um in terms of this because my 
because of my personal understanding of mental health in general, um, not just psychosis, um, but psychosis or voice hearing things is is my particular interest and personal reasons and, and all that kind of stuff like I mentioned. Um, I guess it's because I still don't see it as pathology per se. Um, and but then at the same time, I understand an individual needing or or um, feeling some relief if they take medication that that's not that's not my remit I'm not uh, about um, uh, medication shaming or anything like that so when I say that I had yeah I had the issue with the curing something it was this idea that there's something broken or wrong in your brain and there's I would argue there's not it's your brain has tried to do its best to protect you and that the best thing then um, I, I would argue is that to work on what was the trauma or traumas and then that if we cannot think of it as cure but that might be something that helps either reduce the quantity or the quality of the psychotic experiences for instance i would see that as a positive thing without having to focus on a cure because your brain's broken does that yeah it does make sense i mean i as i said i'm certain that it wasn't medication alone that got me to this place where I can talk about it. I had to have extensive talking therapy to really get into the traumas that led to it and, and work through those. And to an extent, yeah, I'm still working through those. And perhaps as I work through them, my experiences will change again. But I, th I, th I think I agree with you. I, I don't necessarily see it as a pathology. I don't think it's, I mean, obviously, I know there is some research out there that says certain types of traumatic brain injuries can cause psychotic phenomenon. Um, and then that's a different motivation or, or cause, as you, as yeah. you like. Yeah. I but, always have the example of you can have two people who don't hug, one's autistic and one's not autistic, and they look like the same thing, but actually the motivations are different. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't really see, I, I agree with you, I don't really see psychosis as a, as a pathology. I see it as, well, I mean, in my case, almost a necessary reaction to trauma, because I think actually the reality of the trauma I had been through was far more damaging to me than the, the psychotic episodes were. Um, and I think that's why... I, I think that's why my brain came up with that stuff because it was so much easier to rationalize you know if if the world wasn't a random place where traumas could just happen random you know like with without warning you know it was much it was much easier to think oh there's something working against me here you know that's why this is happening because something is making these things happen rather than oh you know the world is a chaotic and random place where terrible things can happen yeah. and i guess my argument would be that um if we want to talk about curing mental health issues of any description it would be to cure the disordered society so disordered people like say living in poverty or experiencing extreme abuse and all this kind of thing if we could reduce the levels of trauma from a disordered society we would see reductions in mental health concerns you literally just took the words out of my mouth uh, you know um if you if you reduce the amount of trauma going on you're going to see less of these experiences happening um and you know that that is what we need to work on as a society it's it's all it's all very well you know people looking for cures to these what they believe to be pathological states um but the real problem in my opinion is especially amongst autistic people the the sheer amount of trauma that we experience um you know i i i know a lot of autistic people and they've all had at least one traumatic experience you know and and because trauma is different for everyone you know it, it can be it, it could be going off to war. It could be being bullied at school. It's it's relative to the person. You know, there, there's there's no one thing that can say, oh, this trauma is worse than that trauma. 
you know and, and I and think so that's really important as well because nobody should get to dictate what is a traumatic experience and and because one person finds something traumatic while another doesn't doesn't change that it was traumatic for that first person no. and then how that person's psychology dealt with it so somebody might um experience say 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 we've got a number of people who experience a very similar trauma and one person they don't seem to it doesn't seem to affect them negatively another person develops psychosis another person develops uh, ptsd and another person develops extreme anxiety you know they're all very understandable um responses to trauma yeah. nobody gets to dictate either what is traumatic or how you respond in uh, whether you obviously we don't do it consciously you don't consciously decide to have a psychotic experience but that is it's sadly it's the luck of the draw but absolutely if we can reduce levels of trauma which would be great for everybody <laughs> involved um i don't want to hold us up too much longer and i've got a feeling my chinese is coming it's always this time of the night um i just want to pick up on i haven't been looking in the comment section at all because i knew i would love this conversation anyway and we love talking to you david um harry and i have really enjoyed you, you the way that you explain and express yourself is, is just great um for us to have these conversations um we just want to double check if there was any really burning questions in the comment section can you just post them now um otherwise um i think we'll wrap up quite soon um but did you have any other things that you might wanted to get off your chest before anyone puts anything in the comment section um no not really um i, th I think we've we've covered a lot of it really tonight i could talk about this forever though to be fair yeah, i probably could as well especially if you start getting into the intersection with my addiction and the way it all links together like you know it's a uh, it's like that meme of you know that meme of the guy trying to explain everything and he's got the cotton everywhere and the wool all over the wall like <laughs> connecting things together I, I get a bit like that once i start um really getting into the intersections between all these things and that's why i made my page emergent divergence is because it gives me a space to try and get into those intersections and, and nice plug it. Thank you, actually. So for those who um, so usually when people jump into the live, you don't see the description for some reason, um, but the description has um, all of well the, the most useful um, social media links for David. And I think there might be um, potentially blog posts in those links as well. Um, if anybody um, is able to donate a pound um they are most welcome to do that as well so there's a link in the description for you to be able to do that so we can pay our speakers um, i'm just having a quick look but yes emergent divergent so if you want to hear about the intersectionality of these things so psychosis for instance and addiction um head to david's emergent divergent page You've also, is it a blog as well or is it a facebook i do have a wordpress blog under the same the same name emergent di <clears throat> sorry emergent divergence uh, dot wordpress dot com lovely thank you i'm just going to pick up on a couple of things we won't i won't take too many because um again dinner um and it's quite late for for um david and i um somebody just asked when hallucinating what happens if you touch the person so i assume they mean if you're hallucinating and someone were to touch you i mean i'm hearing as an autistic person why would you touch them and if they're hallucinating why would you touch them but what would you say i mean it, it depends i mean if they're talking about what happens if you try and touch your hallucinations then that can be that can be different for depending on the person and and the experience you know i i've i've never really tried to touch any of my visual hallucinations and i'm i'm reasonably confident that if i did my hand would probably just go straight through them um as for touching someone who is hallucinating, it's probably not a good idea because especially if they're in a distressed state, suddenly touching someone could be really alarming. And I um, don't know whether they were referring to, I don't know potentially if the person's a, a danger to themselves, but I mean, me personally, if it's an autistic person and or somebody experiencing hallucinations, delusions, it really has to be an absolute last result um to ever touch us in general 
Um, and certainly if we're thinking about restraint, absolutely the last resort is as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of complex feelings about restraint. I've I've been in psychiatric wards. I've experienced restraint of various types. And in my experience, restraint never did anything to help me. Yeah. Um, if anything, it made me more distressed. Um, but I do recognize that it can be very scary to see someone who is incredibly distressed especially if they're having a psychotic episode you know you might wonder well how do I stop this person from hurting themselves or someone else and my advice really would be if someone is really distressed and experiencing a psychotic episode um, I wouldn't necessarily suggest calling the police um, because you know it's another conversation to have but that for me they were never particularly well versed on how to deal with someone like me um but what i did find helpful on a couple of occasions was paramedics um and they you know they had medications which could calm me um they they were generally a bit better versed in mental health than than other emergency services were so if someone is really in a high state of distress and you're worried that they're imminently going to hurt themselves or someone else um call an ambulance would be yeah. my advice and I, I would argue that that would be my advice that's typically what I've done in the past with my mum which is a ambulance over police sometimes we need the police just to be able to get access the building but typically um, ambulance would be the preferred for us if, if we're absolutely um, you know there's no other way that I could get her for instance to a crisis team or something along those lines um, I, I'm just gonna see if there's any others um, Somebody's just asking if their three psychosis episodes are psychosis. Um, I'm going to be clear that I'm not a diagnostician or a clinician. Um, so I'm not going to necessarily be able to answer that question at all. Um, any thoughts on so, what constitutes psychosis? I, I mean, for me, the, the quintessential part of having a psychotic episode is the fact that I didn't believe I was having a psychotic episode. I thought everything that was happening was real. I thought it was 100% real. If anyone tried to tell me it wasn't real, I would cling onto it harder and believe it was even more real. And really that was the key difference for me between you know, having just a hallucinatory experience and having a full-blown psychotic episode was that I 100% believed that everything that I was seeing, hearing, thinking was real. And I think because the person's asking if their three psychosis episodes are psychosis, obviously you've given an example of, of how you would define psychosis itself. But I don't know if they're asking in terms of like potentially going and getting a diagnosis um, because, you know, is it dependent on what you would want that for? I would say, is it not enough to say you've experienced psychosis? potentially for that person i think if it's enough to cause someone distress then they should absolutely seek support for that um, in whatever way they feel comfortable seeking support for that but as i know myself having having a diagnosis doesn't necessarily change anything um, it makes it easier to explain to people what's going on for you but having the diagnosis itself doesn't yeah like you're still having that experience whether you have the it's the same as that whole you know the the discussion around self-diagnosis is in, in autism you know a person is just as autistic before their diagnosis as they are afterwards same as someone experiencing psychosis experiences the same amount of psychosis before as they do afterwards you know obviously they might be prescribed medication that would help them and that can be useful if you're experiencing high levels of distress um but ultimately you've got to you've got to really think about what's what's right for you as a as an individual and i i would always advise someone who is experiencing distressing psychotic phenomenon i would always say go talk to your doctor um but don't expect the diagnosis to really it's not going to make the experience go away having that diagnosis um i'm just going to grab a couple more I don't want to linger on this one too long. I think um, a yes or no, but do you think your best friend being autistic is an accident? Uh, no, I think we we found each other quite 
it, it was not an accident no <laughs> we, we tend to even if we don't know the other person's autistic or if that other person doesn't know they're autistic we tend to gravitate towards each other um simon i'm not sure what you're asking he's put what's am capital am so i'm not sure where what he's referring to there um somebody else said you rock dgh thank you for that um just lots of lovely things so you're an amazingly wonderful human being i concur this is yeah um is there any more questions let's have a look uh, oh i mean if you touch the person who's not there does it feel real oh okay so they've clarified okay well yeah that would depend on the person and the way the experience is happening you can have like tactile hallucinations i've had hallucinations where i can feel things on my skin but it they don't always all come together so you might sometimes hallucinate like you might see a person like my woman in the black dress like i said i'm fairly confident if i reached out and tried to touch her i wouldn't feel anything but then on another day i could reach out and touch her and perhaps i would feel something you know it, it is a uh, it's a bit random you know you can't really predict and, and that's, that's, that's what fascinates me about it is because any of your senses can um uh hallucinate a reality and so that could be multiple senses it might be somebody only ever experiences voice hearing for instance um which yeah. seems to be the most typical um uh, of the hallucinations the interesting one for me is i tend to hallucinate the smell of lilies on my grandmother's birthday and lilies were her favorite flower so you know you, you, any sense can and jessica um hallucinates lavender and sees cats quite regularly so some of hers are quite you know quite nice just yeah. seeing the cat kind of thing um let's have a look going by what oh so that's something um oh so there's lots of really lovely comments so at any point if you want to obviously go back into the comments and just see what people have said just to see the loveliness um oh yes yeah, so donna is saying the paramedics were amazing with her dad too yeah i i do think typically they are the best um bet if you are concerned about somebody in distress um how open should you be with the doctors um i was always scared of being locked up and i, I know you're going to be able to answer this particular question but i've known that that concern for a number of um people experiencing psych psychotic episodes is the concern that they're just going to be seen as as crazy and locked up um i would argue that's um really not that typical that that's going to happen um but i don't know if, how you would address that question in my experience especially in the, i can only really talk about the uk but in the uk there is in fact probably more of an issue with with people who really need to be institutionalized not having access to inpatient treatment um so i think it's more likely that you wouldn't be locked up um, and I, I don't like the phrase locked up because don't get me wrong the psychiatric wards I've been on they did feel like prisons but I really don't like the term locked up because it kind of implies that you've committed some kind of crime and and you haven't you know you're just you're not well and you just yeah. need help um, but I, th I think you should always be open and honest about these experiences and even if a doctor does decide to put you into inpatient treatment there are ways to contest that if you feel it's not fair or or you know unsuitable there are ways to contest that you know there are tribunals and and depending on how concerned they are for you there's different types of um section and act so um some of it might be is it 72 hours just checking for 72 yeah. hours how you're doing and then they make a decision about whether you need to stay or not so there's lots of things that go into these decisions and I absolutely agree with you is that like I say because my earliest I'm 36 like I said and my earliest memory is probably me around three or four visiting my parents on a ward um, all I've seen is declines and decline and decline in um, inpatient services so there was a period in my life where I literally could walk my mum onto a ward and say please take her she's in such distress and they would take her and admit her and then a few years later um, it was almost impossible to get anybody 
to admit her to anywhere and when they finally I think I waited for around it was disgusting I wait I got the ambulance out we we sat in the A&E for eight hours with my mum who like I say I believe she's autistic but she was misdiagnosed with bipolar um, and experiences psychotic episodes um, so eight hours in an A&E for somebody who's in an incredibly distressed state is disgusting and it's not our NHS fault obviously it's the government as an issue we're not going to get political here but by the time she was finally seen um it was like 10 o'clock at night or something and um the only bed they had was uh up north so I live in the southeast and the only bed they had was absolutely hundreds like miles away um so typically what I see with crisis teams now, um, unless they really are very, very concerned about you, is trying to keep you in the community. They um, normally have home treatment teams. Yeah. So to try and allay that fear, I guess, that, um, that's, you know, if you do explain to your doctor that you're experiencing these things, that they're going to lock you up kind of thing. That was that was the person's concern, wasn't it? Um where are we? I've lost it. Yeah, about saying that they're scared that they might be locked up, but I, I really don't think that's really the last resort, I would say. Um, okay. Let's have a look. Um, are we aware of any research that's been done on the correlation between autism and psychosis? I think this would probably be a better question for you than me. Well, what I like I said, I think the um, research paper, let me see if I can actually find it and then I can pop it in the results for you. Um, it's it's really about all the different types of mental health issues we will experience as a result of um, trauma. So let me find the paper because that would be good, I think, for a number of people here. Let's have a look. Here it is. Lovely. Okay. I mean, not lovely. It's not great um, findings. That findings are quite distressing. But okay. So I'm just popping that paper in the. Oh, it's 2019. That paper, the Griffiths paper, um, in the Academy chat, so people can have a look at that. But basically, like I said um, earlier on, is yes, there's a. Um, you see that we have, as autistic people, greater experiences of trauma as children and adults. And then what you then see is an increase in the numbers of mental health experiences we experience compared to non-autistic people, which will include, um, for instance, psychosis and other mental health concerns. Um, but I'm not sure that there's been a specific one. Um, I can look into that at some point. Um, okay don't want to take up any too much more of your time so I'm just going to make sure there's not anything really dire that needed to be answered um, yeah I think that was everybody so that thank you so much everybody for attending I didn't look at half the comments I'm sure I saw some of our regulars being silly as usual but then they always come towards the end with really lovely questions and comments so um, I'm always pleased by that point um thank you so much David and um, like I said I could definitely talk to you about this another point um, it's been a pleasure so so if you just stay there I'll end the live okay so thank you everybody and I Thanks. will well we will see you next Saturday oh we've got a double next week so on Friday the 13th spooky um we are going to be discussing disclosing one's autistic identity in relation and how similar that is to disclosing one's um, sexuality when you're gay or bi, or for instance. So I'm going to be chatting to Annette Foster and Jessica, Tudor Summer Holloway, um, because they're both autistic and they're both um, queer as well. So they're going to come on. We're going to discuss how it's quite similar to have to disclose your autistic identity and how you have to keep disclosing it in a similar way that you might keep disclosing your sexuality. And then on the Saturday, the 14th, We've got Carl Cameron coming on, who wrote a chapter in the Neurodiversity Reader, um, but his chapter was specifically on disclosing one's autistic identity and potentially we can discuss how to and some of the pitfalls and some of the um, 
benefits of doing that as well. So thank you, everybody. See you next week. Bye.